Professor Hennigan, perhaps uh, you could give us your um, gloss on, uh, on what the trends show to, to date. Uh, yeah, look, I'll try and do this and try and keep it, let's try and keep it nice and clear. So in, you've got two distinct different testing strategies that were going on in August. You had the, 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 the government one, which is the detected cases, and they were running at about 1,000 through August. Well, the ONS data at the same time was suggesting actually there's about four times as many people in the background. That's the random sampling. So one of the key issues is that whatever you detect is a function of who come forward. What we saw was in the detectable cases on the 2nd of September was a, an increase in that number. If you go back to the 30th of August, you had about 1,000 detected cases, and that then went up to about 2,600. It's interesting to note that was right around the bank holiday and the Monday when we had Rishi's Eat to Out on the Monday, and that was a huge success, but that actually led to potentially some sense of increase because it's not just that, it's also the delay over the bank holiday. Now we've seen cases about three and a half thousand over that two week period. In fact, it is early enough to start to see rises in deaths because the lag is about 14 days and you're right, it's about three and a half thousand to four thousand. I also want to explain to you though, what happens in September. We've seen on the RCGP surveillance data, a 50% increase in consultations for acute respiratory infection. When you go back to school, when you open up businesses, when we come back of our holiday, there is a highly predictable increase in acute respiratory pathogens. That leads to a near threefold increase admissions for children in emergency admissions in September alone. So it's important to say you're acting against the backdrop of what happens in September for all acute respiratory pathogens. Out of the 200,000 people who are coming forward, it looks like about 25% of them are asymptomatic when they come forward, and about 150,000 who come forward are, have some discernible symptoms. Of them, 97% have some other acute respiratory pathogen on board, and about three to 4,000 have COVID. So it's, get the context in place. It's also important to see what's been happening in places like Oldham. Oldham, for instance, over the seven weeks has been pretty stable throughout. It sort of moved up and down, but it stayed in the top 10. Irrespective of what we've done, actually what's happened in Oldham is the cases have ma maintained quite a, a level between about 60, 70 to 100 to 100,000. But it's interesting, Oldham and Rochdale are in the top two, uh, are in the top 10 of cases right now. But if you go into the Pennine Acute Trust, what you see is there are 22 patients in them trust. So although we've seen rising cases, what we're not seeing is its impact in hospitals and deaths. We are seeing a slight increase, but nothing like what we saw in March and April. Do you have an explanation for that, Professor Hannigan? Yeah, well, I think, look, there are two things. I think it's right to say at the moment is this is a point in time where we have to consider what's the strategy around our, our programme from the government. Are we accepting that the virus is endemic? And when you understand endemic viruses that are seasonal, they circulate weekly through summer amongst the young people. And that's exactly what we're seeing now. We also have an issue with understanding what's called the cycle threshold to understand what viral load of people are accruing. And that's an important aspect which we can talk about later. And then there's the other aspect. When you think about seasonal pathogens, one of the things you've got to be mindful of is you don't push the disease by having delay tactics into the winter when we fare much worse in February, March, and there are a number of reasons for that, circulating co-pathogens, people have immunity issues, we have issues around our uh, vitamin D that we're re researching. But, but remember, between now and Christmas, we will see a fourfold increase in consultations in general practice in a good year we will see an eightfold increase in an epidemic year. We will see a 50% increase in deaths between now and January. And the reason I'm giving this information is to provide context. Thank you, we're grateful for that. Uh, and we'll, we'll drill down into some of the, the local uh, outbreaks with some of my colleagues uh, who represent some of those regions. But just to pick up finally before I turn to them uh, on uh, some of the implications, perhaps of what you said. So if people, especially young people and children, are 
uh, going to the doctors because they've got symptoms that are associated with <coughs> September that they don't have in, uh, in June, July, and August. Uh, are you suggesting that some of the, the increased positive tests comes from the fact that more people are presenting themselves with symptoms for testing than did uh, in July uh, and August, but they might have the same level uh, of infectivity with regard to COVID? I'm saying for acute respiratory pathogens, now there are more people with other infections on board than COVID. But one of the keys about the detection is when you see rising cases, what you're picking up is what's in the background. That's what the ONS survey data tells us. And it's told us all along in the background, it's three or four times higher than what we were think we were picking up in August. And it was circulating weekly amongst the population. Wherever you go in and test more, you'll start to pick up what's there. And that's what we've seen with the strategy. And so when you focus and go into certain areas, there's been a, a strategy that said, oh my gosh, it's going up. But actually what you're picking up is what's there. And there's been an overinterpretation with language like exponential rises. That is an incorrect way of looking at the disease. Most of the increase is in line with a seasonal pathogen that's having a linear increase at this time of year, consistent with the other pathogens that are out there. Um, thank you very much. Let me go uh, quick. I think uh, we'll just get... Uh, Hennigan would like to come in. Yeah, so there's been a fundamental shift in the debate away from protect the NHS and the impact of the disease mm -hmm. to cases. And one of the key aspects is what you really want to know and what we want to know, I suspect, the people in Bolton is to what extent this is impacting on the health care of the population. Mm -hmm. So one of the key aspects is having a clearly defined case definition of COVID and whether it's impacting in terms of care home, whether it's impacting in terms of admissions, and this is one of the key aspects, you see. If we're going to react and have restrictive measures, we should be expected to do them in terms of the impact of the disease. Just to say, in March, the RCGP surveillance data was reporting about 300 to 350 per 100,000 consultations symptomatic across the country. So you can get a level of where we were across for everything at that level. The question is, what's the impact in terms of disease in Bolton? Now, if that changes and there is an impact, healthcare is being consumed at the level where we say it's epidemic, hospital cases are rising, you'll get more trust and buying from the population of Bolton than you will do if you say we've got cases and about 80% of them are asymptomatic and we're not sure what's happening. Okay. And if you did but that... Pro pro Professor Hennigan, can I just ask, because right now the Department of Health is saying that in France, um, hospitalizations have tripled. And last, we're doing comparisons, looking at other countries. What would you say to that? Okay, so if you look at the data in France and Spain, it's starting to flatline. It's not going exponential. It's gone to about 10,000 cases in France and Spain. Interestingly, in France, if you want to test, you have to get a prescription. So you have to come through clinical care and you can only get a test if you have prescription. Second is they have a different private incentivized system for hospitalizing more hospital beds. Some of that may be appropriate, particularly for the very elderly in care homes. We may want to admit more people. That's an important aspect. But there's also an important aspect to consider about this disease as an endemic disease. If you lock down hard early, as France and Spain did, as they open up, there will be areas where there's very low immunity. That could be the case in Bolton, because that's why we're seeing it affecting different areas as we go through this epidemic, this pandemic, sorry. Professor Hennigan, we're gonna to have to, um, to move on. If we keep answers short, then we'll get through more. Very helpful. Graham Stringer. Uh, Professor Hennigan, going back to what you were saying before about the, uh, steady infection rate in Oldham, I think you said it was uh, 60 to 70. What can we, what conclusions, what can we infer from that steady rate? Is it that the measures that have been introduced on behaviour are having little or no effect? Yeah, I think what you can conclude when you start to think about endemic environments, you've got a test and trace programme that's having an impact. But one of the key problems is the government and policy keep intervening soon as that test in trace reports an upturn in cases. So that creates a confused policy. What's the purpose of the, case, the test in trace if all it leads to is lockdown measures? 
So somewhere, somebody is going to say, let's test out the test and trace program. And in doing that, let's see what happens, looking at the impact of the disease in the hospital and see what happens in the terms of the cases. Now, there's an important issue you should be thinking through with the test and trace program is a proportion of people in infected, but not infectious. And our work has showed if you start to use what's called a cycle threshold, look at the amount of virus on board for individuals, you can identify those who are at higher chance of being infectious, and that's the people you go after. But at the moment, because you can shed RNA for up to three months, despite having the infection for only eight days, we are potentially following people who are red herrings. And what's really? happening in Oldham is, as you've seen for about seven weeks, it's just grumbling on. And as you're doing that, your population is developing immunity. It will be harder in a place like Oldham because of the population, the unique issues with the ethnicity and the density. So well, on, that ba sorry. Yeah, on that sorry. basis, you, you have been quite uh, critical of the tests that are based on polymerase uh, reaction, yeah. in, in effect uh, giving us uh, too many false positives. Is that a fair assessment of, of your criticism? And what do you think the response to that should be? So look, the test is a, is a, is a, is a very helpful test. But if you just use it in a blank, blank, blanket policy without thinking through the strategy of what you use the test with what threshold, you end up with this problem of false positive. You are identifying too many people who could have had the infection in the past. And you're not picking up and allowing the one or two people who are what you've just described before, the super spreaders that you need to isolate and get to their contact. So what we need now is once we accept the infection is endemic, is a process where we start to develop our strategy around the testing. And a cycle threshold above 35 generally is people who are not infectious, yet NHS England documentation that has not been updated since January runs cycle thresholds to 45, which is identifying people who are not infectious. Right. I will, we're running out of time. I'll, I'll try and squeeze my last two questions in, into one. There is a certain amount of criticism uh, of the test there. Uh, I'm told there are 200 tests available uh, worldwide uh, for this virus. Uh, have we got the best tests? And is work being done to get what would be the emo uh, most appropriate tests in this country? Uh, in, in the future. And the second question is really uh, to follow up on the polymerase reaction question. Uh, again, there has been criticism that repeat testing gives you far too many uh, false positives in effect. What do you think we should do to counter that effect? Is that too, Graham? Uh, to Professor Hannigan. Yeah, so the first thing is, uh, you're right, there are over 200 tests. Look, we do lead the way in, in science and development of technology and research. But the problem we've got right now is we've got more marketing than science in the, based in the approach. You know, statements like Moonshot are not helping us develop an analytical, accurate test. So that's the problem. What we have to do, and I'm happy to write because we're running out of time, is develop a strategy that uses a test in the most appropriate way so that we can have a sustainable use of this test now and over the long term. But the way it's being used now is inappropriate. Mm. And the issue about repeat tests, Professor Hannah. So, so repeat tests can be very useful. You see, if you're asymptomatic and you repeat the test within about three to five days and the cycle threshold has gone up, you're basically saying to somebody, you are not infectious and we can rule you out that you can carry on about your life. So we can be much more useful about them tests. If it goes down, that means your viral load has gone up and you are the person who is infectious. So there are ways uniquely of using the test that could develop as a much better strategy. And then we wouldn't have the lockdown. We'd be able to use a test and trace program much more efficiently. Okay. Thank you. Can we go to Carol Monaghan, please? Thank you, Chair. Um, if I could maybe follow on from that, uh, last night on Channel 4 News, um, Professor Alan McNally was from Birmingham University was talking about 
a different way of testing. And he was talking about the possibility of, for example, going into a school, testing at random, and if the random test showed that there was an incident in the school, test everyone at that point so that you can actually pinpoint infections. As we're approaching the winter months, do we need to be looking more creatively about the way we are testing populations? Who's that to, Carol? Um, um, well, it, I was directing it towards Professor Hennigan to start with, just because he was talking about the way in which no. we're using tests. Okay. I, wouldn't, um, I wouldn't recommend an approach like that uh, ever, because I just do not think what you're considering is that we're going to test our way out of this, this pandemic. In effect, you're saying random tests will pick up people potentially with dead virus. Remember, it picks up an RNA strand that's shoot 20 nucleotides along. That degrades much slower than the actual infection when you've got it on board. After eight days, we cannot isolate live virus. For up to 90 days, you can isolate the RNA fragments and pick them up when you test. So if you randomly go into school, you might as well shut them down right now. And it's not a process that I recognize in 20 years of experience of being a clinician as a GP or in a process that's aligned with evidence-based medicine. So if we're gonna go down these routes, we have to think of the wider context of what harms does it introduce? What's the social consequences and what's the plan? But I can tell you what's happening right now when a single student, and I've just heard this today, in a year 13 class has a positive test Despite not knowing whether he's been infected or infectious, the whole year 13 has been sent home. So we've got restriction measures coming in now because nobody has a strategy or is thinking through how we use these tests appropriately. Well, look, I think, I think this comes down to, again, I'm gonna repeat the strategy. If you want to suppress and eliminate the virus, you test in schools, you have one case and you send everybody home. If you accept we have an endemic seasonal pathogen and we want to promote education, we want to keep society functioning, you have to have a strategy that minimizes those risks. And what's happening at the moment is the language and the rhetoric is making people so fearful and terrorized that they're going beyond the guidance because they're so fearful of what's coming next. So there needs to be a dialing back of the rhetoric. There needs to be a thoughtful discussion now about what exactly is the government strategy, because I don't understand it right now. And if you clear that up, then everything can flow from that. And I, I do say that actually maximization of education across universities and schools is imperative and keeping our children in school is important. But at the moment, it is utter chaos because of the 50% increase in other respiratory pathogens that mimic COVID in children is creating chaos. Uh, you've really landed on something vital, which is the role that science and technology has got to play in addressing this. Um, so I was intrigued to see a completely new type of test being developed and, and showcased, where it isn't about PCR-based uh, testing. It's about almost a taking an electron microscopy picture of a total virus for which was, was scientists we can also agree is a much more likely to be an infectious agent than a string of RNA and applying AI to it for rapid and speedy tests. These things are all under development, but perhaps could you comment on the likelihood of that happening? Because that solves a lot of the problems. And, I, and, and in maybe Professor Hennigan, so this government strategy is to back our scientists and almost invest in the technology that really fixes the issue. So look, Professor Henning, just a couple of sentences, if, I, if you could. So what fixes the issue here is having a strategy around care homes. In fact, that's where 40% of the but, death... Sorry, just because of the time, yeah. uh, just, uh, you know, so, so, PCR-based, is that something that you've come across? So there's going to be unlikely that we're going to get tests that are going to solve all of the problem unless we integrate it with a clinical and evidence-based approach going forward. Uh, uh, Professor Richardson, yeah. non-PCR...